coming to the last of our studies on Jonah. We have done nine studies already, and we are in the fourth chapter now of the book of Jonah. Uh, there has been a great revival in the city of Jonah, or of Nineveh, as a result of Jonah's preaching. But uh, Jonah himself is upset. And last week we looked at why he was upset. He was upset because he felt that God shouldn't have shown mercy to the people of Nineveh. They were evil people and he refused to accept uh, that God should show mercy to these people. Now um, we are continuing with God's controversy, Jonah's controversy with God. And we come to verse 5. He says in verse 5, John, it says in verse 5, Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. His booth is probably a temporary shelter, uh, possibly made of branches and leaves and things like that that were there. Obviously, it was inadequate because he was fully pleased later on when uh, God provided him a plant. But uh, Jonah is now looking to see what is going to become of the city. Why? Was he still hoping that God would change his mind and destroy Nineveh? Uh, was he waiting for some explanation from God for his actions? We are not told. But what we are told in verse 6 is that God is acting again. Now the Lord appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head so that uh, so uh, to save him from his discomfort. So God has acted to provide a plant to make him comfortable. We really don't know what this plant is. Verse 10 says that uh, it came up in a night. Now that could be a, a figure of speech, what we call the hyperbole, uh, to say that it came out very quickly. Uh, or it could be literally a miracle that God immediately caused this plant to come out. Uh, we don't know what the meaning of the Hebrew word is. Some people call it the castor oil plant, uh, which grows very fast. Some people think it's a vine. Uh, but whatever this plant is, uh, Jonah responded to this plant in a very strong way. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Uh, the, the, the Hebrew literally says, Jonah rejoiced over the gourd, a great rejoicing. Uh, he was terribly pleased. Now it's very interesting. Jonah is terribly upset when the Gentiles are saved and terribly pleased when he's looked after. Both extreme reactions of joy over, in this case, over a relatively small thing. Why such an extreme reaction? Uh, it is evidence of that his security comes from himself. And actually, when people get their security from themselves and how people respond to them, they end up very insecure. You know, um, uh, he seems to be saying over this plant, I deserve God's help. And here is evidence of that. This is the way God should be treating me. But you know, if you trust in yourself, you're trusting something very insecure. When you feel affirmed, you have extreme expressions of joy. But when you are not affirmed or when others are affirmed, uh, rather than yourself, then you can get very upset. Uh, there, there were two girls walking along the street together and they met a friend and the friend looks at one of them and says, you're looking very beautiful today. Now the other one gets very upset. She goes home and she looks at herself in the mirror for several minutes as to why, thinking to herself, why was I not told that I am looking good or beautiful? You know, when we find our fulfillment from how others respond to us, it can be very dangerous. If your trust is in God, you have a quiet confidence that what is most important is not how you do, how people think about you, uh, what you get, what you don't get. 
what is most important in your life is that you belong to God and that he loves us primarily, simply, primarily because he loves us. That's, uh, that's the basis of God's love. He loves us because he loves us, not because how we do and because how others respond to us. Then we can trust him to look after us. This is why Paul said in Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? In Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4, you have another uh, description of this kind of security. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. When our mind is stayed on God, it is stayed, it stays uh, rested and uh, sitting for security on an everlasting rock. To such, the greatest source of joy is not things that happen to them. It is the fact that God loves them. Now, verse 7 tells us that, um, uh, but when the dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm to attack the plant so that it withered. Again, you find the same word, God appointed. Earlier, he appointed a fish to save Jonah. Uh, then verse 6 tells us he appointed a plant to shelter Jonah. Now he is appointing a worm to discipline Jonah. God is teaching Jonah in a most graphic way. He has been complaining that God didn't destroy um, the Nineveh. Now, God wants to show that does, that doesn't mean that God is incapable of, in, of destruction. So he appoints a worm to destroy Jonah's shelter. Uh, and, um, and you know, uh, when God not only blesses people with what they regard as good and comfortable blessings, sometimes he blesses people with chastisement you know, um, uh, or what we call discipline, such as discomfort, pain, and even heartache. The disciple knows that if the teacher loves the disciple, that teacher would dis uh, discipline them, to, to teach them a lesson, to burn off impurity, to direct them along the path towards greatness, which is God's desire for us. He desires to make us great people. And in the process of becoming great, discipline and chastisement is necessary. In fact, it's one of the supreme examples of God's holy love. Um, uh, the clearest example of that, of course, is in the cross of Christ, when he loved us so much as to send his son, but he hated our sin in his holiness that the son had to suffer on our, in our place in order that we may be forgiven. In Proverbs 3 and verse 12, the Bible says, The Lord reproves or disciplines him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights, uh, which is again cited in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6. So, God disciplines Jonah. Now, in verse 8, we find the peak of God's discipline, of God's chastisement. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Again, God is appointing. Earlier he appointed a worm to break this plant. Now he is appointing a scorching east wind. Uh, now, we, we are not really told uh, the exact meaning. We don't really know the exact meaning of this word scorching wind. But um, uh, when wind combines with the sun to beat down on the head of Jonah, with his shelter gone, it must have been terrible. The situation is desperate. He, grow, he grows faint and his desire for death returns. Uh, chapter 4. Uh, and verse 8, the second part, again he says, 
I don't want to live. It is better for me to die than to live. His despair has peaked. God has treated him the way he expected God to treat these sinful Gentiles, the Ninevites. Earlier he wanted to die because God uh, treated the Gentiles the way he expected God to treat the Israelites. You can imagine his frustration. He has a stubborn heart and God is trying to reach out to that stubborn heart of Jonah. He is brought to the end of himself before the great message of this book is taught. And so we now come to verse 9. God speaks again to Moses and says, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah snaps back at God. He says, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Uh, again, you know, he's now shouting at God. He's angry with God. And God's response is so typical. He doesn't rebuke Jonah for his attitude. He knows how much Jonah can handle. So instead of rebuking Jonah, he gently but firmly reasons with Jonah. This is, a, this is what we would expect from a loving father. Even when a child is angry and shouts at the father, uh, the father realizing the frustration of the child speaks to him gently but firmly. And, um, and you, we, this is the similar response that he gave to Jonah, uh, to, to, to Moses, to Jeremiah, to Elijah, when they were struggling with the consequences of obedience uh, that they had, they were experiencing. God disciplines us, but he does so wisely. He knows how much we can handle and what is best for us. He never lowers his standards, but he varies his tone without varying his demands. So we come to verse 10. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which, you, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. God is trying to stress to Jonah that he had no deep tie with the plant that withered. There was, he did nothing for it. He had no investment in this plant. It came up suddenly and died suddenly. Yet Jonah seems to be concerned for the plant. He's upset about the plant. Next, God talks about his relationship with the people of Nineveh and says it's much more serious than Jonah's relationship with the plant. So verse 11, God's concern for the people of Nineveh. And should I not pity Nineveh? That great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. God is describing the people of Nineveh, these wicked, rebellious people who had hurt the Israelites, who had hurt Jonah's race. He is describing them as a needy people. More than 120,000 persons are there, says God, and they do not know their right hand from their left. What he's saying is they don't know how to make moral judgment. Jesus said something similar uh, uh, in another of his great, of the great missionary texts of the Bible in Matthew 9, 36, when we are told that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. We are told that uh, he had compassion on them and asked that people go out as laborers, to pray that people will go out as laborers. He was filled with compassion or pity when he realized that the people were like sheep without a shepherd, not knowing where to go, how to make moral decisions. And here there are 120,000 people, all made in the image of God, so here, God is expressing his concern, his compassion for the people. 
He says, should I not pity them? Should I not be concerned? As another translation puts it. You see, the fact that people do not know God is the greatest tragedy in the world. We have a tendency for us to focus so much on other needs. And, 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 and that's right. There are great needs that we have to be involved with. AIDS, hunger, unemployment, poverty, the environment. These are all important needs. And the Bible is very clear that these are things that we as God's people need to be involved in. We must be uh, active in alleviating things like AIDS and hunger and unemployment and poverty and helping to improve the em environment. And I hope that many of God's people, many Christians, I hope many Christians will go into professions that are involved in alleviating such need in the world. But the greatest need that people have is to know their creator, to know the one who made them for himself. Because it is when they know their creator that they understand the purpose for which they were created. They find the meaning of life. Paul says about the Jewish people who actually had rejected him, who had hurt him, who had plotted to kill him. This is what he says about these people, Romans 9 and verse 2. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, my relatives, according to the flesh. What a contrast Jonah is to Paul. The Jews rejected Paul. They rejected his message, but he was willing to die to take the gospel to them. Jonah wanted to die because he was angry that they had accepted his gospel. But God shows here that his concern for the lost. You know, today people uh, tend to downplay this idea of lostness because it seems embarrassing for us to think of people as lost. But that's how Jesus mentioned people who don't know their creator. He said, the son of man came into the world to seek and to save those who are lost. Uh, and, and so God yearns for people. God yearns to bless people. God yearns for, for them to have a relationship with, with him. So Jonah was asked to leave his comfort zone, to leave Israel and to go to this difficult place to take God's message. And he did so unhappily. Paul, however, did the same thing with a passion. In 1 Corinthians 9, 16, he says how he paid the price for this. He said, necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. He had a burden to take this message to others. And then he says how he paid a price because of that burden. He says to the Jew, he became like a Jew. To the Greek, he became like a Greek. And to the weak, he says, I became weak. He didn't say I became like a weak. In order to win the weak, he says, I became weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might bring salvation to some of them. The attitude of Jonah is seen a lot today. Deep down, many people are not willing to pay the price to get different kinds of people into their churches. They don't want to change. They don't want to grow because that would make them uncomfortable. They are happy with the way they do church. There was a university in America uh, which, was just, uh, which had a church just next to it. And uh, there, were not, there was nobody actually from the university who was going to the church. And uh, the members of the church, the leaders of the church said, this is not right. We should minister. We should serve the university community. And let's, let's start praying that God will send people so that we can help people from the university. Uh, now, um, this was during the time of the hippies when people used to grow their hair long and have flowers in their pockets and, uh, you know, not wear shoes and things like that. And one Sunday, while the pastor was preaching, 
a university student who was a typical hippie type young person walked in to the church. He had long hair and uh, uh, he was not wearing shoes and he walked into the church and he came right to the front of the church. Now the pastor was preaching and he came right to the front of the church and as um, uh, and then he came up to the platform and he sat on the floor and he was listening to the pastor seated on the floor while the rest of the church was in their comfortable seats. Now there was an old elder in the church. He was one of the leaders of the church, an old man. He saw this person coming to the front and sitting down and he also came to the front. And the members of the church were wondering, what is this old man going to do? Is he going to ask this young person to leave or to get him to sit on a chair? Well, what the old man did was, he came and he, with great difficulty, came and squatted or sat down on the platform next to this young man. And he listened to the sermon along with him. This is what God is calling us to do. Jonah didn't want to do that. But we love people. God has loved us. Now his love is in our hearts. And as we love people, we will go and help them, whatever that cost is. So God continues to call his people to mission. How did Jonah respond? Well, we are not told. The book deliberately leaves us hanging, leaves the story line hanging there. Some will accept God's message and pay the price. Others will reject it and, re and prefer to remain comfortable in their own churches, in their own pews. There was a pastor called Thomas John Carlyle who wrote a book called You, Jonah, a book of poems. And this is how he ends this book. It's about the last chapter, the passage that we were looking at. And Jonah stalked to his shaded seat and waited for God to come around to his way of thinking. And God is still waiting for a host of Jonahs in their comfortable houses to come around to his way of loving. Are we trying to have God to come around to our way of thinking? Or are we willing to come around to God's way of loving? Will we go as servants of our people and show them the love of Christ, paying whatever price has to be paid so that we can show them that love? Let us pray. O oh Lord, help us to come around to your way of thinking. Thank you for the way in which you have loved us, shown us your mercy, and given us a place in your family. Lord, may that love now motivate us, drive us to pay the price to be servants of the people around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.